Chapter One of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter One with the French Showman. Only fifty centimes, ladies and gentlemen, only fifty centimes more, and you see my little dog perform. He shall walk for you, he shall play dead for you, he shall do a dozen tricks as soon as I have but a few more covers. A showman dressed in tights stood in one of the squares of the city of Paris. Near him sat a small dog, looking sharply at a crowd of street people gathered around in a ring. Again the showman walked about, holding his white pointed hat to collect coppers from the crowd. He jingled those he had in the hat, and glanced here and there in search of more money. One or two pieces were given. "'Thank you, sir. Thank you, madame. Now I need but thirty centimes, only six sous more, and the show begins.' A little schoolboy, who had just pushed his way into the crowd, dropped two coins into the hat thank you little gentleman now who will pay only twenty centimes more to see the finest show now before the people of paris my little dog will drill with a rifle a wooden rifle so that there be no fear of harm to any one he will carry the flag he will play the drum do not keep the people waiting only a few sous more and the show begins again the hat went round and this time a few more coins made up the required sum now exclaimed the showman look alive sir the dog who had never moved until he was thus spoken to jumped up to the top of a drum sat up on his haunches as dogs do when they beg and looked straight at the showman are you ready said the master the dog answered by giving three short barks very well then we will begin by putting you through your drill take your rifle he handed a little wooden gun to the dog who held it upright between one foreleg and his chest order arms the dog allowed the gun to slide downward present arms the gun was raised and held forward between the forepaws and so the drill proceeded the dog cleverly carrying out the orders as soon as they were given. Next followed a sort of play in which the dog acted out some verses recited by the showman, telling how a shepherd sleeping with his faithful dog by his side was awakened when wolves attacked the sheep, and how the shepherd and the dog attack the wolves and drive them away. The little dog jumped about and barked fiercely to show how bravely he had fought in his master's surface. The crowd applauded and laughed, and some of them threw more money into the hat. When this act was over, the showman announced that the dog would now sing for the people. So he drew from his pocket a small fife and began to play the Marseillaise, while the little dog growled and howled an accompaniment that sent the crowd into roars of laughter. On the outskirts of the ring of people were two black-eyed, dark-complexioned folk a young man and another older they seemed greatly interested by the dog's cleverness but they did not laugh at his tricks instead while the other spectators were laughing these two men whispered together in low voices and speaking a strange language they were gypsies belonging to that old old race that is found in all civilized lands making its living in all ways honest and dishonest and often moving about from place to place while the little dog was performing and the jolly crowd of parisians were joking and applauding him the older gypsy was saying in his own language when the man and dog are through let us follow him that dog is worth much money we can make much if we have a fine dog like that perhaps the showman would sell him the younger man grinned at this and replied in the same low tone the other had used oh yes he might sell him 
but better yet he might lose him and then if we should happen to find him the older gypsy nodded his head and turned to watch the dog's clever performance meanwhile the younger gypsy went on perhaps if i should find anything it would be good if i had a large basket with a piece of stout cord to tie up the parcel there are yet several tricks to come so you watch while i go across the street the young man hurried away and the older man waited impatiently just as the dog was playing dead which was the last trick on the program the young gypsy returned carrying on his arm a large covered basket you are in time said the older man and in a moment more the dog and his master made their bows to the crowd the man slipped a loose suit of clothes over his costume and picked up his drum as the crowd scattered the showman walked away followed at a little distance by the two gypsies but these men did not walk together one was about forty feet in advance of the other they followed the showman who walked slowly since it was now dusk and he did not mean to give another performance that afternoon the dog trudged along after his master he did not trot about briskly as pet dogs do when taken out to walk but being tired kept along at the showman's heels in this way they walked for quite a distance from the square where the show had been given then as the old gypsy came to a cross street he suddenly turned into it and went at a very quick pace sometimes even running until he had come quite around the block and was in the same street again with the showman the dog and the other gypsy that is he went around the block and met them he walked straight up to the showman and catching hold of the drum that the man was carrying on his shoulders cried out aha you villain you thief ah i have caught you then with my drum it is my drum that i lost last week i have been watching for you in all the city come now give me my drum and he pulled and hauled at the poor bewildered showman while the man so suddenly attacked for a moment lost his wits and found not a word to say there were several passers-by and all at once gathered around the two men meanwhile the other gypsy had come up but he merely circled about the outside of the throng waiting his chance whenever the showman tried to speak the old gypsy would begin again his wild outcry about my stolen drum my lost drum suddenly one of the french policemen appeared pushed his way through the crowd and began to question the gypsy and the showman about their quarrel both talked at once whenever the showman tried to say a word the old gypsy took good care to talk louder and to wave his arms about as if he were very angry where was the little dog he had tried to keep close to his master but the legs of the crowd got in his way and he had been forced outward this was what the younger gypsy was waiting for he was the only one that paid no attention to the two squabbling men and he kept watching the little dog when he could reach him the young gypsy quickly grabbed him by the throat wrapped a piece of twine about his jaws lifted the silent dog and popped him into the basket the policeman had by this time restored order and the showman was allowed to reply to the old gypsy's accusation he said the drum had been bought in a store not far away the old gypsy laughed aloud oh, you are a bold one said he you know well you never bought it why sir he went on turning to the policeman my name is written on the inside of the drum with ink if he is honest let him open the drum and we shall see pierre de bois inside as plain as print if it is not so then i will gladly pay him five francs for his trouble i am an honest man and i may be wrong if i am wrong i will pay for falsely accusing an honest man for that is only fair is it not so my friends and he turned to the crowd standing about who greeted his speech with a murmur of approval the poor showman saw that he would have to accept these terms and though he was angry he put down the drum and began to loosen the cords that held the drum heads at this moment the younger gypsy turned slowly and carelessly and walked away whistling a doleful tune no one noticed him and he soon turned a corner and was out of sight of the crowd 
Then he quickened his pace, and, seeing an empty cab passing, he called the driver, got in, and was driven to the other end of the city, carrying with him the covered basket and the poor muzzled dog. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Gypsy the Talking Dog A Story for Young Folks this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gypsy the Talking Dog A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 2 The Dog Meets a Friend. Of course, the old gypsy had kept watch out of the corner of his eye to see when the young man got away, and now he began to change his tune and to talk more reasonably. "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'I fear I may be wrong. That drum looked like mine, and yet it may be not quite so old. Still, I will pay if I am wrong, and a minute will decide. Ah, now, the drum is open.' He stooped and raised it, looking carefully on the inside as if searching for the name Pierre Dubois. Then he put it down with a sigh. Ah, alas! he exclaimed. What have I done? I have made a mistake. I have still lost my beloved drum. And I owe this honest man five francs for the trouble I have given him and the shame I have brought on him. Here is the money. The gypsy drew a coin from his pocket and offered it to the showman, who was busy putting the head again on the drum. But suddenly the showman now that he was cleared of suspicion, remembered his dog. "'Where is my dog?' he cried, rising to his feet and looking about him. No one answered. In fact, at first no one remembered the dog. Then the old gypsy spoke. "'Did you have a dog?' "'Yes,' said the showman. "'I had a little dog. Where is he? Did you see him?' "'I saw a dog with you.' answered the gypsy, or rather near you, but a small boy picked him up and ran away. I thought the boy owned him. What kind of a boy was it? the showman demanded excitedly. Oh, a little fellow about so high. The gypsy held his hand about three feet from the ground. He wore a black blouse and had blue eyes. He went up the street and, I think, turned the corner, but of that I am not sure, for I was thinking of the drum, which reminds me, here are the five francs. "'I do not care about the money,' said the poor showman, "'but I must find my dog, or else I am ruined.' The gypsy threw the coin upon the drum. "'Take it,' he said. "'It is little enough for the trouble I have cost you, "'especially now if your dog is gone. "'I am sorry, but I cannot stay longer. "'Here, I will give you my address in case I can be of use.' "'Drawing a pencil and scrap of paper from his pocket, "'the old man wrote out the name Pierre Dubois "'and added a false address. "'Then he walked slowly away. "'The showman looked after him uneasily, but what could he do?' There seemed to be no reason to suspect anything wrong. The policeman, too, turned away. The crowd went about its business, and the showman at last shouldered his drum and went gloomily along the street, wondering whether he would ever see the little dog again. For fear he might be followed, the old gypsy went that night to a distant quarter of the city, and it was not until late the next day that he dared go to the young gypsy's lodgings. He rapped twice, paused, rapped twice, paused, and then rapped once. "'Come in!' cried the young gypsy, and the two thieves were together. "'Have we got him safe?' was the old man's first question. "'Yes, but he's as ugly as a cross-bear,' answered the young man. "'Thrash him!' said the old fellow. "'I've done better,' answered the other. "'I have starved him.' He'll soon be better tempered. Keep him dark until we sail, the old man went on. It's only a few days now, and that fool of a showman will be sure to go to the police about the pup. Trust me, said the young gypsy. 
I'll keep him in the basket till we're on the ocean, and then, once safely in America, who is to know where we picked him up? It was lucky for the evildoers that they were so cautious, for the police of Paris are clever, and for several days they searched high and low for the poor showman's dog. If he had been taken out of the basket, or had been allowed to make a single bit of noise, the thieves would have been discovered. But it was not to be. The little dog remained in the basket until the gypsies, with others of their band, had embarked on a steamship from Harve, France, to New York, and he was miles from land when first released. Once he knew he was out of reach of aid, the little dog was sensible enough to make friends of his gypsy captors. He even went through his tricks when they wished him to, and thus secured kinder treatment. He had been stubborn at first, through grief at the loss of his master, but, finding that he was starved or whipped for ill nature, he concluded to make the best of his lot. On board ship, the gypsies let him roam about freely, since they had no fear of his escaping them. When the dog wished to be by himself, he would often make his way to a traveling box stall that stood on the lower deck. In this stall was a beautiful black pony named Golopov, with a long white mane and tail. Golopov was kind to the homesick little dog, and the two often talked together. The little dog learned that Golopov was a Russian who had long before gone to America and was now returning from a trip to Europe with his master and his master's wife. After the dog had told his story, Golopov advised him to be cheerful, to gain the goodwill of the gypsies, and to seize the first chance that offered him a fair opportunity of escaping. "'Gypsies are wandering folk,' said Golopov, "'and their nomadic life.' "'Their what?' asked the dog. "'Nomadic,' said Golopov. "'It's a kind of a fancy word. I like fancy words, and I use them now and then. But what does it mean?' "'Nomadic means wandering,' Golopov answered. "'Then I suppose I'm nomadic now,' said the dog, "'because I'm wandering, you know.' "'You're wondering from the subject,' Golopov said a little stiffly. "'I'll try to use more dog-like words, but my French is a little rusty, and I never could enjoy your growly dog language. As I was saying, you must be good till you run away. When you can run, you must run, and run fast. Run to where I am. Be a good dog till you can run.' "'You needn't talk like a primer,' said the dog a little crossly. "'Oh, very well,' said Galopoff. "'You will perchance discover my residence. "'It is situated in the suburban district of the metropolis.' "'That I don't understand at all,' said the dog. "'I was only joking,' Galopoff said. "'Now, listen. "'When you come anywhere near B, that is where I live, "'you run away.' There is a family living near us that has a girl named Helen and a boy named Christopher. They'll be good to you, and if once you can get into their house, you are all right. I'll let my master know about you. Goodness! How can you? exclaimed the little dog. Do you talk to human animals? To be sure, whenever I choose, Galopoff answered coolly. But it is against the laws, said the dog. I make my own laws, said Galopoff. I use my judgment. You find Christopher and Helen, and as for the rest, you may rely on my help. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Chirac Gypsy, the Talking Dog, A Story for Young Folks, by Tudor Jenks Chapter 3 The Home of Helen and Christopher Christmas morning always seems a little different from other mornings. The sun rises more slowly, at least until it is just over the edge. And then, as you reach up to pull out the pin that holds your stocking to the edge of the mantle, 
the sun rises and climbs up the sky so as to peep in at the window and see what santa claus has been using to stuff the stocking out until it looks like a battered leg one christmas a little girl woke up very early so early she couldn't see the face of the clock she tried to go to sleep again but could not then she began to talk to herself now she said it is either christmas eve or else it is christmas morning if it is Christmas Eve, I ought to go to sleep again so as not to bother my mother. But if it is Christmas morning, I want to get up and see what's in my stocking. I don't see how I can tell which it is unless I can see the clock. So she jumped out of bed and went over to the mantel. The hearth was cold to her feet, but she stood on tiptoe and found that the clock hands pointed to half past three. There now, she said. I was wrong both ways. It isn't Christmas Day and it isn't Christmas Eve so what is it then there came into her head the answer in verse twas the night before christmas but while she was thinking over the lines suddenly she noticed that the room was very still and noticed that the clock was not ticking the clock is not going said she if that isn't the meanest thing i ever knew just when i don't know what time it is i wish i had a watch maybe i'll get one this christmas by this time Helen, which was her name ever since she was baptized, had crawled into bed again and was crouched close up to the headboard. She did not want to be a bother, and yet she did so wish to get the stocking that was hung in her mother's room. While she was wondering about the watch, she suddenly saw that the sky was a rosy hue, and then she knew that the sun was coming up, that it wasn't Christmas Eve, and that it was Christmas Day. With a flying leap she was out of bed, and was looking wildly for the armholes of her wrapper or bathrobe. In order to lose no time, she tried to find her slippers with her feet. The more haste, the less speed. While Helen was trying hard to thrust one arm into the pocket of her robe and one toe through the heel of her slipper, she heard a bugle call on a toy bugle, and then she knew that her brother Chris, christened Christopher, was already up and doing his best to undo Santa Claus's work in stocking packing. Chris always gets ahead of me, said Helen, either because he's a boy or because I'm a little scatterbrain. I'm not sure which. Helen unwound herself from the tangle she was in, put on the bathrobe first and the slippers next, and then tore away through the hallway to her mother's room. She knocked. A voice said, Come in, old Merry Christmas. And Helen was before the stockings. Christopher was on the floor surrounded by a ring of presents, the bugle, a box of soldiers, a sword, a gun, a knapsack, and a general military outfit. This was because Chris was just at the age when he loved soldiers better than anything else. He was far down toward the toe of his stocking, and Helen knew that she would have to hurry to catch up with him. How the pink ribbons and tissue paper did fly! It was like a snowstorm in the apple orchard in springtime. First came the very thing she wanted most, then came what she wanted next, and then her third choice. Below that was a box of chocolates, and then something nearly as good and so on until she had come quite to the very end, and there she found the best possible gift to go in the toe of a Christmas stocking. What was that? A five-dollar gold piece. Did you get one too, Chris? asked Helen. Chris made no direct answer in words, but he put his gold piece into his eye like an eyeglass, saying, Ah, oh, Willie, excuse me, ah. Uh. After a hurried examination of the presents, the two children were hustled out of the room, with strict orders to dress and get down to breakfast as soon as they could when they really tried, and, considering that it was Christmas, they made good time. After breakfast came the presents that Santa Claus had left downstairs for fear of waking the family by bumping them up the steps. No matter what these were, it was enough to say that, after the bundles were all unwrapped, the parlor looked as if there had been an explosion in a toy store, with a ribbon maker's next door on one side and a paper maker's next door on the other side, and Chris and Helen were busy and happy among the ruins. On Christmas Day, there comes a time when the mother of the family says, Come, children, surely you're not going to spend all this beautiful day indoors. A brisk walk over the snow in the sunshine will brighten you up wonderfully. And then the children say everything they can think of to prove that fresh air is not good for them, that they have been walking too much for their health, that they can go better any other time, that nobody ever goes walking on Christmas Day that they don't want to, that, of course, they will if mother says so, that they thought she didn't mean what she said, that, and then they'll go. 
Christopher and Helen thought they were going to be very unhappy over leaving their toys, but to their surprise they found they enjoyed being away from them for a while. Besides, they weren't away from all of them, for Christopher had his new four-bladed pocket knife, and Helen had her new gloves with fur around the wrists, and they could talk about all the others. It was a delightful day, just cold enough to remind them it was winter, and with enough snow on the ground to make it a real white Christmas. Christopher and Helen lived in the country, and yet it was not far from the city, and their father went in and out on the train every business day. They thought this was the best way to live. They had all the pleasures of both city and country, and knew how to enjoy each in turn. Chris was explaining this to Helen as they walked along. You see, Helen, said he, if we were real country children, we might not know just what to do with our gold pieces. There are not many ways of spending money in the country, you know, and so I suppose we'd have to put our money in one of those little iron banks and leave it there till, well, maybe till we were grown up. I wouldn't like that, would you? No, Helen answered. I'd rather keep mine in my pocket until I go to the city, and then I can go into one of the big toy stores. Have you brought yours with you? Chris asked, drawing his from his pocket. Here it is, said Helen. It's in this purse and she held up a blue silk purse with two cut steel rings upon it. While they were talking, they were walking along a road that led up over a hill to the next town, a small place with one business street and a number of little houses. They had now come to a place about halfway between their own home and the town, where there was a grove of tall trees. As they reached the top of the hill, they saw smoke rising from this grove, and wondered what it could come from. Going a little farther, they saw two or three wagons in the grove, and around these a number of men, women, and children. A crackling fire made of dead branches was blazing on the ground, and upon the ashes around it were some pots and pans. The people seemed to be cooking their breakfast. I believe they are gypsies, said Chris in a low voice. What are gypsies? asked Helen. I don't know much about them, Chris answered, except that they don't live in houses, but go around in their wagons and live outdoors. I wish I was one. I think you're silly, said Helen. I'd rather have a comfortable house. Anyway, I'm going to speak to them, Chris said after a pause. Aren't you scared? Helen asked. Scared? No, was Chris's answer. I heard father and mother talking about gypsies the other day, and he said he thought there was no great harm in them. Whether there is any harm in them or not, Helen insisted, I don't think you ought to go nearer them without father's knowing it. Let's go home and tell him about finding the camp and see what he says. Chris was very curious about the gypsies and would have liked to talk to some of the boys he saw near the camp, but his love for soldiers had led him to learn how soldiers act, and he felt sure that he ought not to take any risks so long as Helen was with him. His father had often said that it was Christopher's duty to look after his sister's safety always and never to give Helen any needless alarm. So now, remembering all he had been taught, Christopher gave the order, Right about face, forward, march. Helen turned at once, and the brother and sister started for home. They had not gone far when they heard a sudden shout behind them and a scampering of feet. They looked back and saw one of the gypsies chasing a little dog. The man was coming toward them and running as fast as he could go. But, fast as he ran, the little dog ran faster, and long before the man reached the two children, the dog had passed them and was far ahead. The gypsy, seeing he could not catch the dog, began to pick up stones and throw them after the flying animal. But all the stones went wild, and the dog, turning suddenly, darted into the woods and disappeared from view. The gypsy, muttering to himself, turned back and walked along the road toward the camp, until the hill hid him from view. The children made their way home, seeing neither the dog nor the gypsy again, and until they told their father about seeing the gypsy encampment, Chris and Helen thought no more about the runaway and the pursuer that night, being completely occupied with their Christmas presents. And that was the first time that Chris and Helen saw the little gypsy dog. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a Story for Young Folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Chirac Gypsy the Talking Dog, A Story for Young Folks, by Tudor Jenks Chapter 4, 
The Gypsy Dog Finds a New Home Back of the house where Chris and Helen lived was a clear space, in which there stood a long pole planted in the earth. From the top of this pole a rubber ball in a net hung at the end of a long string. On the day after Christmas the back door of the house opened and Helen appeared, carrying a racket in her hand. Closely following her came her brother, also armed with a racket. The children took their places, one at each side of the pole, and then began a game of tetherball. It is exciting, and, like most good games, a little trying to the temper. Each player attempts to wind the ball close up to the pole by hitting it with the racket. And when it begins to wind up the way the other player wants to have it, you are very good-natured if you do not feel like whacking something else than the ball that goes whirling high above your head. Chris won the first game, Helen won the second, and the third was a struggle. Wang-bang went the rackets, and the ball flew wildly around, first one way and then the other. Just as it was almost wound up the way Helen was driving it, the string broke, and the ball flew off and fell among some thick bushes. The children started to search for it, when suddenly, out from the bushes came the very same little dog they had seen chased by the gypsy on Christmas Day, and in the dog's mouth was the ball for which they were searching. At the other end of the dog, so to speak, there was a sort of blur by which the children saw that a stumpy tail was being wagged at a high rate of speed. The little dog came trotting up to them and dropped the ball at their feet, but the tail kept on wagging without a moment's rest. Dogs wag their tails in a dozen ways. There is a sort of wag that says, Oh, I wish you'd pay some attention to me. Kick me if you like, but do pay attention to me. I'll do anything if you'll only speak to me. Dogs that wag their tails in that way usually roll over with crazy delight at a word. The little gypsy dog was not that sort. His tail wagging seemed to say, How do you do? I'm a mighty pleasant kind of a dog when I'm treated right, and I rather like your looks. Suppose we make friends. So plainly was this message of the tail signaling that Chris said, Come here, old fellow. You're a fine dog, and it was nice of you to bring back the ball. And then he held out his hand toward the dog, and kept it still until he was sure padding would be agreeable to his new friend. Helen, too, went down on her knees and gently put one hand on the little dog's neck. In the delight of this meeting, the game of tetherball was forgotten and never finished. While the children were making friends with the dog, suddenly the gypsy, who had been chasing him the day before, rushed forward from around the corner of the house and seized the dog by one of the hind legs, at the same time striking him with a switch or light cane he carried. "'You little wretch! How we been bashing, Jukal! Ruffy Lee Ma, I may feck a bar and mar you, Jukal!' cried the gypsy. At first the children were so surprised by the sudden appearance of the man that they could only watch him with open eyes. But as soon as he struck the dog, Helen crouched closely to the dog to protect him and cried boldly, "'Here, stop that! This instant! You shan't beat the little dog!' The gypsy looked angrily at her and then said quickly, "'Chee-chee! Hushly Ronnie Le Ducal is mine! Javri! Go away and mind your business! The dog is my own and I'll beat him if I please! Take away your hands or perhaps you'll get a taste of the stick too!' The gypsy had kept hold of the dog's leg, and now raised his switch again as if to carry out his threat. But, as soon as he made this motion, Chris, who had said nothing, raised his racket and brought it down so hard on the man's arm that he dropped his switch and began to hop about with pain and rage. Then he turned angrily to the boy. But Chris never budged. He eyed the man coolly and kept his racket ready. "'The dog may be yours,' said Chris, "'but my sister is mine, and I don't allow anyone to raise a hand to her.' Seeing the boy's boldness, the gypsy became more respectful. He glanced uneasily at the windows of the house, for he could not believe the boy would be so brave unless some grown person was near. Chris's father had gone to the city, and his mother had gone with her husband. The servants were all women, and Chris had no reason to think there was any aid near, but he stood his ground without flinching, and the gypsy spoke more politely. "'Little Ria,' said he, "'I don't blame you for standing by your sister. I was wrong to raise a hand at her.' but I came for my dog. At this moment the gypsy paused and looked about him. The dog, as soon as the gypsy had let him go, must have run away, for he was nowhere to be seen. It is no use talking now, said the gypsy with a grin. You can't give what you haven't got, but I know the dog well. He will be about here, and so I'll go back again for him. If he comes, shut him into the cellar and keep him till morning. Your father will be home then, and I'll see whether he will not tell you to give me my own. I'm no Jukal Femler. And, if you wish to keep the dog, you can pay me my price. Now I will jaw drum, so barry dues. Thereupon the gypsy touched his slouch hat, picked
picked up his stick and sauntered off. "'Weren't you afraid of him?' said Helen, when the man was out of sight. "'No,' Chris answered. "'Besides, what could I do? I couldn't leave you, could I? I wonder where the little dog is.' Chris began to whistle very softly, and then, as there was no answer, more loudly. Helen, too, began to say, "'Here, doggy! Here, doggy!' and both children walked about among the bushes trying to find him. They kept this up for a while, but at last became tired of searching. They had lost interest in their game of tetherball and decided to go indoors. Then, as soon as they reached the back door and turned the knob, there came a rustle in the bushes, a quick rush, and the little dog was dancing about them with head and tail trying to shake out goodwill. "'Open the door, quick, Chris!' cried Helen, "'and we'll take him in.' So soon as there was a crack wide enough to admit his body, the dog wriggled in, and the children followed. The door was shut and bolted, and the children at last felt safe. Apparently, their little guest also felt safe, for he at once quieted down and trotted along by the children, sniffing here and there, as all good dogs do upon visiting a new place. Once or twice he sniffed loudly, almost as if he were sneezing, which is a way dogs have. It is as if they didn't like the scent and wished to be rid of it. The children would have been glad to play with their new companion, but they soon saw that he was too tired for sport. He seemed willing to oblige, but was drowsy, and seeing a low and cosy armchair in a corner of the sitting room, he turned his head on one side as if to ask permission, and then hopped into the chair, turned around three times to wind himself up, and went to sleep before he had more than settled himself in a comfortable coil. Chris and Helen sat down on the hearth rug, and began to discuss what their father would say about the gypsy's right to his dog. Of course, a man has a right to his own property, said Christopher, and if he says he must have the dog, why, I suppose we must give it up. Just then the little sleeper in the chair stirred uneasily and softly whimpered in his dreams. Hear him, exclaimed Helen. It may be as you say, Chris, but I know one thing, and that is, the man has no right to whip the dog when he's good. But perhaps he's not a good dog, Chris suggested. Oh, he's a good dog, Helen answered. I know he is. How do you know? Why, because of the way he wagged his tail when he asked to come in with us, and because of his being so polite about the chair. When was he polite? Chris asked. Didn't you see him? Why, he wouldn't even get into the chair till he had said, may I? I tell you, he's a well-bred dog, and he doesn't belong to the gypsy. That's just like you, said Chris, smiling at her. You go to making up a lot of things about the dog and then thinking them all true. We don't know a thing about him. Yes, we do, Helen insisted. I can tell whether I like a dog in the same way I can tell whether I like a person. And this little fellow is a fine dog. So I say let's keep him if we can. The dog slept most of the afternoon and did not really become wide awake until dinner time, after the father and mother had come from the city. Chris and Helen were so eager to tell all about the gypsy's visit and the coming of their new pet that they had to be suppressed and sent to make ready for dinner. Then, during the dinner, they had no chance to talk because table chatterboxes were not in favor in that house. But when the after-dinner coffee was served, their father turned to them and said, Now, Helen and Chris, you have the floor, provided you do not both talk at once. Suppose you begin, little girl, and tell me about your first sight of the new dog. Afterward, Chris can give the facts concerning Mr. Gypsy's visit and other important matters down to the present time. Meanwhile, I will see that our small guest doesn't suffer from hunger. The little dog had remained quietly upon a rug before the fire, never once begging even to be noticed. And now, when food was put before him, he helped himself without either greediness or fussing. Then, Chris and Helen told their stories, their father and mother listening attentively, and now and then asking a question. When the stories were finished, the father said, I think I should have done precisely what you have done. That is, if I wanted the dog. Of course, the dog may belong to the gypsy, but then again he may not. If the gypsy doesn't own the dog, why, it may be that you can keep him. I doubt whether the fellow ever comes back. I hope the gypsy will not come, said their mother. The children have been wild to have a pet ever since they have learned to know Galopoff, the pony. If they can't have a pony, I'd be glad to have them own a nice dog. I hope the gypsy doesn't come after him. Just then, the doorbell rang. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a Story for Young Folks. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 5 The Gypsy's Flight. Hearing the bell, the party at the dinner table became silent. They could not help listening, for all believed that the gypsy had come. After a moment, the maid entered and told Chris's father that there was a man in the hall who wished to see the gentleman of the house. Do you know him? the father asked. No, sir, the maid replied. But if you'll excuse me, sir, I think it's the gypsy gentleman. I heard the children talking about. He looks like that. He's sort of a dark and... Very well. Show him into the reception room and ask him to be kind enough to wait a moment. As soon as I finish my cup of coffee, I will see him. The maid left the room and Helen said, Oh, father, have we got to give up the dog? I can't tell yet, her father replied. I must hear the man's story, and then I will decide what we ought to do. You wish to do what is right, of course. Yes, father, said Helen slowly. I suppose I do. But it is ever so much nicer when it's right to do what you want to do. I never had just the kind of dog I like best, and this one is such a bright little fellow. I believe the gypsy stole him, said Chris, boldly. You shouldn't say that, remarked his mother. It isn't fair to the man. Well, I will see what the gypsy gentleman has to say for himself, the father said, and left the room. There was little talk in the dining room after the father had gone. Both Helen and Chris sat quite still gazing at the sleeping dog and wishing they could hear what was being said in the reception room. Gradually, they began to hear the sound of one voice that became louder and louder. It was not their father's voice, so they knew that the gypsy was arguing for his rights. At length, their father returned, and speaking quietly, as he always did, addressed the children. "'I wish,' he said, "'that you would come with me. I would like you to hear what the gypsy says about you.' Chris and Helen were only too glad to go, and both jumped down from their chairs and followed their father. They found the gypsy seated in a large armchair with his legs sprawled far out on the rug. As soon as he saw the children enter, he rose to his feet and scowled crossly at them. "'Now you shall see,' he began, but the children's father interrupted him. "'Excuse me,' he said. But I will, if you please, let the children know what you have said. You can correct me if I do not state it as you told it to me. Then, turning to Christopher, the father went on. He blames you for having taken the dog from him. He says that on Christmas Day you and Helen came walking toward their camp in the edge of the woods. That you called the dog, that the dog ran to you that he followed, and the dog then ran to our house. Then, he says, he came next day while you were playing some game with rackets and demanded his dog. You then said he could not have his dog, and when he tried to take it, you, Christopher, struck him. Now, is that true? It is the truth, every word, said the gypsy, frowning at Christopher and shaking his finger. I asked my son said the father, and you must let him answer. But the boy will deny it, said the gypsy. Christopher's father turned on him so fiercely that the gypsy backed away. Be silent, or you will leave my house at once, said the father. Now, Christopher, you may answer. Part of it is true, part of it is not, said Christopher. We did go walking near the camp, but we didn't call the dog. The dog ran away, and this man chased him and threw stones at him. Then it is true that the dog came to our house, but it was all by himself. 
when this man came after the dog he caught him by the leg and began to whip him helen told him not to and then he raised a switch to hit her i would not do such a thing exclaimed the gypsy but chris without taking his eyes from his father's face went right on and so i hit him with my racket that is the truth very well said his father now how about the dog we did take him into the house chris said because he ran away from this man and did not come out of the bushes till he had gone i don't know whether that was right but i thought it was and i'd like to keep him if we may but the dog is mine said the gypsy i am not yours there was a new voice in the room all turned and there on top of a small table was the little dog sitting up as he had been taught to do in paris by his master for a moment all gazed in silence then there came the sound of the dog's voice again i am not yours he repeated you stole me from my master and brought me to america but said christopher's father in rather a scared voice i did not know dogs can speak lots can't replied the little dog but my master taught me i was the only friend he had i speak french best but english a little i have heard english while with this thief for he is a thief he stole me in paris and brought me here i must talk to tell you the gypsy seemed struck dumb he gazed hopelessly about and then suddenly darted through the door out into the hallway and in a minute more they all heard the front door bang the man had run away as soon as the door shut the little dog jumped to the floor and trotted back into the dining room the father son and daughter looked at one another speechless with amazement at last helen spoke wasn't that clever of him but her father replied i am simply amazed he certainly talked i heard him so did i said christopher nodding his head of course he did said helen too but i'm glad of it i always wanted a pet that could talk and now we've got one oh i am delighted and she began to jump up and down but think of the wonder of it said her father parrots talk said helen and so do ravens and some other birds and i'm sure a dog knows more than a bird it is the most remarkable thing i ever said her father and then he stopped let us go in and see him said christopher so they all returned to the dining-room where they found the dog curled up in the chair where they had left him seeming to be fast asleep how strangely you all look said the mother as they entered what has happened it is no wonder her husband replied we were arguing with the gypsy when suddenly the little dog came in and began to talk you must be dreaming she said it is impossible we all heard him said helen it is absurd her mother insisted you are excited and you took his growling for words we all understood him christopher insisted perhaps the gypsy pretended to make him talk said his mother they are tricky people that might be the father agreed but the dog called him a thief and said that he stole him said helen and the gypsy man ran away still he may have been frightened when christopher contradicted him said her father and he may have taken that way to escape i will believe almost anything rather than that the dog talked even though i thought i heard him but parrots talk helen said once more so they do suppose you go to bed said her father at all events you have the dog whether he can talk or not and that is the main thing 
I think I will go over to the gypsy camp tomorrow. Possibly I can make it all right with the man. He seemed to be frightened about something, and perhaps if I give him some money to let us keep the dog, that will make all satisfactory. Yes, please do, father, said Christopher. For even supposing the dog did talk, and I think he did really, he may not have told the truth, and I'd like to feel that we had some right to him. I've a good idea, exclaimed Helen. You and I will give father our Christmas gold pieces, and then we shall feel that the dog is our very own. That is, if the gypsy is willing. Their father did not wish to take their money, but they were so eager and so much displeased when he refused that before they went to bed they had persuaded him to take their Christmas money to pay for the little dog. The next day their father went to the camp and met the gypsy. At first the gypsy said he did not care anything more for the dog, and even refused to talk about him. But when he saw that it was the father's wish to pay something for the little fellow, he gladly took the money, saying, "'Let it be for good luck, then.' Later in the day the camp was broken up. The gypsies packed their belongings into wagons, and a long procession wound over the hill and far away. So the little dog succeeded in finding Christopher and Helen, as Galopoff had advised. But although the children talked often to him, he would only bark or wag his tail, and seemed to forget that he had spoken. "'What shall we name him?' asked Helen, a few days after the gypsy's visit. "'The gypsy called him some queer thing like Jackal,' said Christopher, "'but I don't think that is a good name.' "'I'll tell you what,' Helen exclaimed. "'We have been calling him the gypsy's dog, and we are used to that. "'Suppose we just name him Gypsy. "'There is a good short name for that, Jip. "'Besides, it will remind us that he came from the gypsy camp.' "'But if he's stolen, that isn't his right name,' Christopher objected. "'If he did talk,' Helen began, but Chris interrupted. "'You know he did. Father and mother may doubt it, but they're not used to make-believe, and so things surprise them.' "'Well,' Helen went on, "'we'll wait till he tells us his true name, and meanwhile we will call him Gypsy.' End of chapter 5 Recording by Linda Olson Fytuck, Los Angeles Chapter 6 of Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks, by Tudor Jenks, Chapter Six. A Confidential Talk. Chris and Helen were for several days eager that the dog, whom they now always called Gypsy, should talk with them, or at least make a remark, so that they might be sure he had talked but though he looked very wise and seemed to understand what was said to him, he would do nothing more than other dogs do, bark, growl, sniff, and now and then whine. The truth is that Gypsy was thinking. He was wondering whether he had done right in speaking. He had done so because he was afraid he would be sent away to the Gypsy's camp again, and he had not been treated well while there. They had tried to make him perform tricks so that they might earn money by exhibiting him, but he had never done any more than he had to do. Still, he wondered whether it would not have been better to have waited. Possibly he might not have been sent away and he had never talked before to any human being except his old master. While he was thinking this over, he suddenly remembered that in their talk on the steamship, Galopoff had advised him, or at least encouraged him, to speak. 
so now he made up his mind to have a talk with the pony how should he find out where the pony lived of course chris or helen would have told him if he had asked but gypsy did not like to ask he puzzled over the question for a long time while he lay dozing in a nice woolly rug that had been put near the open fire for his use and at last he thought of a plan that might work he had kept pretty closely to the house but he was not confined in any way and so after chris and helen had gone to school in the morning he had freedom to go wherever he chose he began by studying over the roads near the house until he had a good idea where they went then he ran out for a mile or two upon one of them and began to trot about in a great circle keeping the house in view in this way he went all around until he came to the place where he had started the very road along which he had run away from the gypsy camp the next day he made a wider circle and the day after one still wider he hoped in time to find some road over which the pony had gone he thought he should be able to come upon some of Galopov's tracks, and with the wonderful power of scent that dogs have, he would then be able to keep to the track until he could follow Galopov home. The plan succeeded. One day, it was the fifth after he began his search, he suddenly recognized the scent that he remembered meant the little pony gypsy was so delighted that he jumped into the air and squealed with joy and then with nose close to the ground he began to track the pony's course away he went trotting as fast as he could follow the tracks and so busy that he forgot everything else suddenly he heard something coming up behind him and before he could turn a voice cried out look out there puppy gypsy jumped aside looked up and there close behind him was a pony carriage with galopoff between the shafts the voice that had called to him was that of the lady who was driving gypsy was so excited that he ran along beside the carriage barking as loud as he could apparently Galopov did not recognize his little friend, for he trotted briskly along without paying any attention. The lady in the carriage, she was alone, seemed amused by the dog's playfulness, for she spoke to him kindly and chirruped to him. But he had no eyes for her, as he was trying to get near enough to the pony's head to exchange a word or two with him two or three times the dog came almost to the pony's nose but just as gypsy began to think he could begin the conversation the pony would go a little faster and then gypsy's legs would have to fly to keep up faster and faster they went until the lady said whoa there galopoff where are you going surely you're not frightened by that foolish little puppy but Galopoff only turned his head slyly, closed one eye, and then went on faster than ever. At length, Gypsy began to tire. He had never been used to running very fast, and besides, he had been a long way that morning and was tired when the race began. So Gypsy decided that he couldn't catch Galopoff and would have to let the pony go on. He slowed down meaning to follow the carriage at a distance to his surprise no sooner did he change from a run to a trot than the pony also slackened his pace and the slower gypsy went the slower also went galopoff then he knew that the pony had been playing with him and so he gave himself no trouble to do more than just keep along back of the carriage they went on for a mile or so at a gentle jog trot and then Galopoff turned into a stone gateway, stopped before a pretty house, and the lady got out, leaving the pony to take the carriage to the stable by himself. 
the lady kindly patted gypsy as she left the carriage and then she went indoors gypsy followed galopoff to the stable and seeing that the pony would not talk until he chose the little dog sat quietly by until the unharnessing was over and galopoff was in his stable the beautiful stable that had been put up for him especially the little dog had sat by so quietly that the stableman who was really not much more than a boy being a nephew of patrick galopoff's old friend made no objection when gypsy followed galopoff into the stall the boy's name was terence he had been instructed to let galopoff have his own way and he saw that the pony did not object to the dog so terence went about his business and gypsy and galopoff were left together don't you know me galopoff asked gypsy yes said the pony but it is a dog's age since i saw you on the steamer not quite said gypsy but it is a good many months well i am here so i see answered the pony and you made very good time getting here i really had to trot quite fast to keep ahead of you but why did you i wanted to speak to you and tell you how i came why did you run away from me didn't you know me certainly i know you well enough galopoff replied but i thought we'd better wait until we were by ourselves now i shall be glad to hear about your adventures since i saw you with the gypsy man i suppose you took my advice and ran away gypsy told galopoff about his life with the gypsies about his escape and finally about the scene where the gypsy had come to claim him and now galopoff he said i'm worried because i had to speak out before all three yes all four of them i was afraid you see that they might give me back to the gypsies but now they all know that i can talk and i'm afraid they will want me to talk all the time as a rule galopoff said it is wisest for us talking animals to speak only to children but i don't see what else you could do if i were you i wouldn't trouble myself about it any more you know that they can't make us talk i know gypsy answered but i am afraid now that they won't let me go go where go back to my old master why should you wish to go asked galopoff pulling a wisp of straw from his feed-box and chewing it slowly as he looked kindly down at the serious-faced little dog did i ever tell you about my french master gypsy asked and then went on i know i didn't you see he and i were not like most i was really all he had in the world he was poor and miserable when i first met him he brought me from my country home when i was a tiny puppy while i had hardly got used to having my eyes open and i think he bought me only because he was lonely at that time he was a clown in a small circus not the kind that travels about but the kind that doesn't said galopoff i know i was a circus pony once before i made my fortune and retired before that he had been a soldier and had fought somewhere in those foreign countries none of us knows anything about speak for yourself said galopoff interrupting you mean tonkin it is a country with which i am not unfamiliar but one which you of course know little it is not your fault but go on yes i think that was the name of it he was wounded there so he couldn't do the tricks that he used to do and he then became a clown clowns lead very sad lives at home how absurd galopoff exclaimed clowns are just like other people see here my friend by the way what is your name now the children named me gypsy the dog replied and i think i like the name very well don't you 
it is a charming name galopoff replied i think that most names that begin with g are charming but never mind i was going to advise you not to make so many remarks about things go right on with your story i know most of the things you put in to fill up and you haven't much time i shall have to send you home pretty soon as i have a thinking engagement with myself this afternoon yes sir answered gypsy i will try to tell a straight story well as i said my master had no friends and he lived alone in a little attic he went out into the country one day that the circus was closed and seeing me playing before a cottage he burst out laughing because i was so awkward asked galopoff slyly no graceful gypsy replied gravely so he went in and bought me from the peasant woman and took me home as soon as i was old enough he began to teach me tricks the first thing he taught me was to sit up and then he taught me to sit down galopoff suggested no sir to roll over gypsy answered and so it went on until i had completed the first part of my education i must have learned rapidly because although my master could teach me for only an hour or so a day yet about the time i was about a year old i was ready to be exhibited then he took me into the circus and gave me an act to those unfamiliar with circus life stop right there said galopoff that is the kind of remark i want you to leave out i graduated from the circus before you were littered i forgot gypsy said and resumed his story soon my master found that the people were delighted with my part of the show and he thought he could make more money by showing me in the street he bought a big drum so that i could stand on it and do my tricks and we started in business for ourselves was the venture profitable galopoff inquired sir gypsy asked did it pay oh yes sir those were our happy days how little we think that those happy times whoa there galopoff exclaimed yes sir i forgot we had a good time then and my master began to teach me to talk i knew only dog language pig language hen talk and pigeon lingo with just a few words of country french when he began but i soon learned to talk easily with him my master was amazed when he found i really talked long sentences but no one would believe what he said about it and i wouldn't talk when anyone else was there i think said galopoff interrupting him that i shall have to bring this very pleasant interview to an early close i found your story a very delightful one and now i suggest that you tell me in a few words what is troubling you at present you have a good home plenty to eat no poor master to bother about and you can simply settle down as a petted lapdog and grow old and fat at your leisure at this remark gypsy rose from the stable floor and began to trot toward the door galopoff trotted after him stopped him at the door and inquired why do you think you are going gypsy stopped as indeed he had to for galopoff stood directly in front of him i was going home gypsy said i did not like what you said about being a petted lapdog i am a respectable dog i have always worked for my living and whatever petting i have had i have earned besides i care something about my master he has always shared fairly with me and i can't bear to think that he is in want while i have more than i need you come right back here galopoff answered 
i said that only to see whether you were in earnest you're a little trump that's what you are i divide dogs into two classes trumps and tramps those that do some givin as well as gettin and those that take all they get and growl because there isn't more of it the two animals walked back to where they had been talking now said galopoff you may consider me your friend galopoff is your friend that means a great deal you will find i think you are quite right to do something for your old master i did the same toward mine and now we are both prosperous i advise you now to go straight home and as soon as a good opportunity presents itself you have a talk with your master the children's father i mean tell him briefly about your life and your wishes there are some human beings that animals can trust i have trusted my friends and all has gone well with me did you ever read my life no said gypsy i can't read very fast in english and not much better in french you should read it said galopoff it is published with illustrations i'll send you a copy of it some day when you have time to read it carefully cause it doesn't do me justice but it gives some idea of my career i think i shall write an autobiography some day something about the horseless said galopoff don't mention the senseless things what would you think of an iron dog that wagged its tail by clockwork and barked by steam i do not like the idea said gypsy with a sniff of disdain it seems very undoggy that will show you why i hate autos galopoff said but to return you must tell your new master that you would like to go in search of your old one let him help you remember not to frighten him at first by talking too much say a word or two and then let him get used to the idea that you can talk good-bye galopoff said gypsy you have been very kind and i appreciate it i'm not kind it's my disposition the pony replied people are good to me and so i am good to others come and see me again after your talk and we'll decide what to do next i like your pluck in running away from the gypsies and you may count on me to do all i can to help you the sun was far down and the roads were shadowy when gypsy took his way back to his home not a bad little puppy remarked galopoff to himself but he needs guidance. End of chapter six. Recording by Linda Olson Vitak, Los Angeles. Chapter seven of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry Gypsy the Talking Dog A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks Chapter 7 In the Gypsy Camp One day, while the old gypsy and the young one, the very same two that stole the dog from the poor French acrobat, were playing cards near a fire before their tent in the woods, the younger man drew some coins from his pocket. Nearly all of them were silver, but among them were two gold pieces, the very pieces that Chris and Helen had found in their stockings that Christmas morning, and later had paid as the price for keeping the dog. The old gypsy, whose name was Alexander, had quick eyes, and before the young man, his name was Joe, could slip the money back into his pocket, Alexander cried out, Oh ho, oh ho, I see yellow. Have you found a gold mine? And how does it happen that you have kept so much of the sonicky? I don't know what you mean, Joe answered, hiding the money as quickly as he could. Sonicky? Why, tis the name of our folk for gold, as you know well enough, Alexander replied. The word I know, but your meaning I don't know. Don't be foolish, the old man insisted. I saw the yellow boys in your hand plain enough. So where did you get them? I didn't want them, Joe replied 
but somebody gave me them, and they've brought me no luck since I took them. You remember the little dog we brought from Paris? Yes, Alexander replied. Where is he? I missed him when I came back from the big town. Those two yellow counters are what I got for the pup, said Joe. You sold him too cheap, far too cheap, even though he cost us little enough, said the old gypsy angrily. If I had been here, the dog would not have been sold. He was worth ever so much. I couldn't help myself, said Joe. Wait until you have heard about it, and you won't blame me. Alexander drew out his pipe and filled it in silence, waiting for the young gypsy to tell his story. Then began a long talk that lasted until their supper time, and was even continued afterwards, until each man had wrapped himself in his blanket and was sound asleep under a wagon. At first the older man scolded when he had heard about the loss of the dog, and then he decided upon a plan to make everything all right again, as he put it. Whatever the plan was, it seemed to require that Joe should arise early next morning, for he was the first up in the camp. As he had not undressed, he had only to wash at the stream nearby, pull on his old cap, seize his walking stick, and he was ready to depart. He did not even wait for breakfast, but took the road at a swinging pace, and left the camp behind him without the knowledge of anyone except old Alexander. Gypsy Joe walked all that morning, stopping only to buy a sandwich as he went through a town on his way, and this he ate under a tree beside the road. During the afternoon he was hailed by a farmer driving in a wagon, and invited to ride. Joe hopped in, and proved so jolly and amusing that the farmer insisted upon going a mile or two out of his way in order to take Joe to the next town. This town was on a railroad, and going to the station, Joe bought a ticket and rode for an hour or two in the cars. By evening, Joe was within a mile or two of the house where Chris and Helen lived, and it was only just becoming dark when he knocked at the back door. To the servant, Joe spoke politely, asking to see the master of the house for a moment. He was invited in, but refused the invitation, preferring to wait outside. Before long, the children's father appeared and asked, "'Did you wish to see me?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Oh,' said the father, "'you are the man that came after the dog.' "'Yes, sir, and I have come again. "'I have made up my mind that I wish to buy the dog back again, "'and I have brought the money.' "'For a moment the father hesitated. "'He did not know exactly what to do. "'He did not wish to give up the dog, "'and yet he was not quite certain of his right to keep him. "'At length, remembering what had happened the last time Joe was there, "'he said, "'I do not think you have any right to the dog.' You ran away when you were accused of stealing him. That was not like an honest man. Then you took the money for him, and you left this part of the country, or at least you did not come again to the house. Now you ask to buy the dog that you say is yours already. You can see for yourself that you do not act as an honest man would act. If you'd insisted from the first upon having the dog, I might have told the children to give him up. But now I think it would not be fair to them to let you buy him again. "'Then you will not sell me the dog?' "'No,' the other replied firmly. "'The dog belongs, so far as I know, to my children. "'You have made a fair bargain, even if the dog was yours. "'And if they wish to keep the dog, I shall not ask them to give him up. "'Will you see whether your children will let me have the dog again?' Joe asked. "'Certainly. Wait a moment, and I will ask them.' "'Joe sat down on the doorstep outside, and the father went to consult Chris and Helen.' In a short time he returned. No, said he, they say they think they have a right to the dog now, and they will not give him up. Besides, to tell you the truth, I don't believe you can keep that dog, even if he were given to you. Why not? Because when the dog heard me speak of selling him, he immediately ran out of the open door and hid himself somewhere. I feel sure he would run away if you attempted to keep him. Let me get a steel chain on him, and he will stay as long as I choose said the gypsy. But no matter. We gypsies have our own laws, and one of them is that we keep our bargains. So long as I took money for the dog, he was yours. But now I want the dog, and I shall have him whether you sell him or not. So take back your money. Here are the very gold pieces. Goodbye. Then, before a word could be said, the gypsy threw the gold jingling to the floor, and turning was gone into the night. The father followed to the door and listened. 
but it was already dark and it was impossible to see which way the gypsy had gone so returning the father picked up the gold pieces and took them with him to the room where chris and helen were sitting by the lamp studying their lessons for the next day what did he say father asked chris have we got to give up the dog he said that he would have the dog in spite of us his father replied and he repeated the conversation as nearly as he could recall it ending by showing their gold pieces you may as well have them for they are not mine and the gypsy refuses to keep them helen exclaimed i don't want the money and he shall not have the dog and she looked ready to cry but chris calmly picked up the five dollar gold piece and thrust it into his pocket saying the more fool he i'll keep the money and i'm glad to get it and i'll keep the dog too if he thinks he can steal so bright a dog as gypsy with me and you to look out for him he'll find he has a tough job i am almost sorry said their mother that we ever saw the dog nice as he is for i'm afraid the gypsies may make trouble for us still i don't blame you for keeping him End of chapter seven chapter eight of gypsy the talking dog a story for young folks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks, by Tudor Jinx. Chapter 8. Plans for a Journey. As Joe was slinking away in the darkness, he was suddenly startled by a barking close at his heels. Before he thought, he jumped into the air and began to run. Gypsy, for it was the little dog who had seized the opportunity to annoy his old enemy, ran after the man for a few rods, snapping at the heels of his shoes, barking and making all the noise he could. In a few minutes, Joe stopped, and turning round, waited for the dog to come up, hoping to catch him. But the dog was too wise to keep up the attack. He had meant only to give Joe a good scare, and having done that, he now turned and made his way home, chuckling and wagging his tail to himself in the dark. Gypsy's wandering outdoor life had made him wise and cautious. He did not know but that Joe might be sly enough to slip back to the house before him, and so Gypsy followed the man's trail at a distance until sure that he was not coming back. It was so late when Gypsy returned to his home that Chris and Helen had gone to bed, their mother was sitting at her sewing in the parlor, and the father was in his study, reading. Gypsy scratched at the door until let in, and then trotted into the study, jumping softly into a chair near the table where the children's father was sitting. "'So you are back again, you wise little fellow,' his master began. "'You showed your good sense by keeping out of the way.' for that man would have picked you up and carried you off like a bag of meal. Grumph, said Gypsy, moving uneasily. But there is one thing I don't understand, the man went on, really talking to himself, and that is about your speaking that night. I'm certain somebody spoke. Grumph, said Gypsy again. He was trying to make up his mind to talk, but it came hard to begin. That's right, old fellow. Speak up, said the master, laughing. Now, this made Gypsy a little angry. It was as if his master thought he was an ordinary dog that couldn't speak if he liked. Being angry, Gypsy spoke right out before he thought. Then I will speak, said he. If you will listen for a few minutes, I'd like to explain things. So you can speak, exclaimed his master. I shall begin to believe in fairy stories next. How came you to learn? One gets used to anything. The first time Gypsy spoke, it had seemed almost miraculous. Now it was simply wonderful. And as he went on talking, his master soon forgot that it was even unusual. My master taught me. He was one of those that travel about the streets of Paris, giving shows in the little parks and on the sidewalks said Gypsy, and then he briefly went over his story again, much as he had told it to Galopoff. 
When he had finished, the children's father, who had listened very attentively, remained silent for some time, before he had thought out just what he wished to say. At last he said, What you have told me has made me understand much better all that has happened. Now I can see that though you were willing to come to us for a while, rather than stay with those men that stole you, yet you would like to get back to your old master. Am I right? Yes, sir, the dog replied. He was good to me. I helped him make his living, and now he is all alone in the world, and I don't know how he can make money enough to get along. He made a living before he had you. True enough, Gypsy replied. But that was when he was in the circus. Since I have been with him, he has not kept in practice, and other men have taken his place. Besides, I know he did not like to work in the circus. I think I ought to get back to him if I can. You have been good to me to defend me when that man tried to get me back, and your children, too, have treated me kindly. But unless you or they very much wish me to stay, I think I should like to leave for a while. They have gone to bed now, said their father. But in the morning I will have a little talk with them and see how they feel about it. Thank you, sir, Gypsy replied gratefully. Now I will say good night. Good night. And, by the way, what is your name? For, of course, Gypsy can't be it. No, sir. I had a different name. In fact, I have had several. But, if you don't mind, I think I will keep the name the children gave me. You see, that name will always remind me of the time I spent in the gypsy's camp, and so it will keep me on the alert to avoid being stolen by those men again. I hope your lodging here is to your liking, the father asked. Entirely so, was the answer. I have never fared better. Good night. Next morning, the father talked with Chris and Helen about Gypsy. He told them what the little dog had said, and asked them to think it over during the day. They were delighted to learn that Gypsy was willing to talk, and both of them wished to find him, but their father said they must not bother him just then. Think over what I have told you, and when you come home from school, let me know whether you are quite willing that Gypsy should have our consent to his setting out in search of his old master. But father, Chris began, but their father, shaking his head and laughing, left them, showing by his manner that he did not care to say anything further on the subject. Chris and Helen talked about the dog all that day at recess, though, to tell the truth, there was nothing to settle, since both of them were willing that Gypsy should go. They were sorry to lose him, but they felt they really had no right to keep him, and besides, they hoped he would find his old master. Wouldn't it be fine, said Helen, if Gypsy could go across the ocean and bring the poor Frenchman back with him? Yes, Chris answered. It would be fine for him, but I don't see exactly where we come in. Do you suppose Father would let me go with him? Of course not, said Helen scornfully. You are only a boy. What could you do to help him? He doesn't need a ticket to go anywhere. He can run nearly as fast as a horse. He can pick up a living almost anywhere, and he can make friends with people everywhere he goes. If he had you along, you'd have to pay your way. You'd have to carry baggage. People would think it queer for a boy to be traveling alone. And there are a dozen good reasons why Gypsy would do better by himself. Don't you think so? Chris didn't reply for a little while. He was thinking it over. He could not deny that Helen's reasons were all good, and he knew his father wouldn't let him go. Yet he hated to give up the chance, so he tried to think up some good objection to Gypsy's going alone. At length he asked, But how is he going to get across the ocean? While Helen was thinking what reply to make, the dog himself came into the room. Here he is, said Helen. I am going to ask him for myself. At this, Gypsy pricked up his ears, sat up on his haunches, and remained in the attitude of attention. See, said Helen, laughing, he's all ready now. I believe he will answer me if I talk to him. Tell me, Gypsy, she went on, turning to the dog. Do you mean to go to Europe to look after your old master? 
Yes, said Gypsy. There, cried Helen joyfully. I knew he'd speak to me. Oh, Gypsy, do talk a little with us. There's nobody else about, and we do wish to know your plans. Well, Gypsy answered, it comes hard for me to talk, because I'm not very used to it, and I'm afraid. Afraid of what? Chris asked. Afraid you'll laugh at me. Oh, we won't, truly, Helen exclaimed. We should be glad to have you stay with us, but we think you ought to help your master if he is in trouble. But can't we write to him for you? I don't see how you can. I don't know how to tell you where he lives. I can go there, but I can't tell you the names of the streets. I see, said Chris. But how can you get across the ocean? In the boat, said Gypsy. Yes, but maybe they won't let you on the boat, Chris objected. I'll just go on board when they put out the plank. Do you know where to take the steamer? Helen asked. I think so. And anyway, Galopov can tell me. Isn't he the pony that is owned by the Russian who lives in the big house over there? Chris asked. He is the pony, Gypsy answered, and he can tell me. How? asked Chris. Can he talk too? Can all animals talk? Gypsy didn't know what to answer. He didn't know whether Galopov wished everyone to know that he talked. So he answered, Some of us can talk to each other. I can understand him pretty well, and he is a wise little horse. Very well, then, said Chris. I think, and Helen thinks too, that you'd better go, so you'd better pack up your things. I have nothing to pack, said Gypsy. We find what we need everywhere. Now, I think I will start in the morning, early, before you are up. It is cooler for traveling then, so I will say goodbye. Gypsy held out his paw, first to Chris and then to Helen, and they gravely shook it. Where are you going now? Helen asked, as Gypsy dropped down on all fours. I think I'll trot over to see the pony, and get a few directions for the journey. Don't mind my going. I will come back here some day. Goodbye. Then Gypsy trotted out of the room. End of chapter 8、Chapter、Nine、of Gypsy the Talking Dog, A Story for Young Folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks, by Tudor Jenks. Chapter Nine. Out into the big world. Gypsy had not meant to start quite so early in the afternoon, but as he trotted from the room, he wondered why he should not go. He was all ready; every one was willing, and the sooner the better. He thought, if he had meant never to come back. He might have felt depressed on leaving a home where he had been so well treated, but he intended to see the place again, and it was a bright sunny day, and so he suddenly determined to begin his journey at once. There was but one thing remaining; he wished to have a little talk with Galopoff before starting out for himself. So away he went along the road leading to the grounds where Galopoff's stable was. He had no adventures on the way except a meeting with a big dog who rushed out from a house he was passing. Gypsy tried at first to get by unseen, but the big dog could run faster than he and forced him to stop for a few words. "Where are you going?" growled the big dog. "Going to call on a friend," Gypsy answered politely, trying to resume his progress. "Here, here, hold on," growled the other. "Or do you want me to nip you?" I'm in a hurry," Gypsy said. "Never mind, your hurry will keep," the big dog said threateningly. "Who's your friend?" "My friend is the Russian pony," Gypsy replied, seeing no reason for making a mystery of it. "Oh," said the big dog more respectfully, for he had once tried to scare Galopoff by barking as the pony was passing, and had then received a lesson from one of Galopoff's flying little hoofs. A quick tap upon the nose, that the dog did not forget soon. 
Well, you can give him my regards. He'll remember me. My name is Bruno. So run along, small pup, but be more respectful to big dogs in future. Gypsy hurried on, glad to get away from the silly fellow, and met no other living thing until he found Galopoff. Galopoff was not in his stable, but Gypsy followed his tracks and found the pony in a little meadow not far away from the house. Galopoff was wearing a very pretty blanket, and seemed quite pleased when, after their greeting, Gypsy told him it was very becoming. Yes, said Galopoff, twisting his neck around so as to have a good view of the embroidery. I think it looks well on me, but then most things do, especially stylish things. The most becoming thing to me, though, is the high yoke that I wore when I was at home in Russia. That was really exquisite. I like silver sleigh bells, too. Still, I don't suppose you came here to talk about fashions. What's the news? When do you mean to make a start? I have made a start, said Gypsy. I'm on my way now. Where are you going? I think I will go to Paris. Across the ocean? You have to, to get to Paris, said the little dog quite simply. Galopoff gazed at him a moment in silence, but he saw that Gypsy was not making fun of him, simply stating the truth. So Galopoff went on. And did you come to say good-bye? Yes, Gypsy answered, and also to see whether you could give me any good advice about my journey. This pleased Galopoff. He dearly loved to give advice, and so he pawed the ground thoughtfully and tried to think of the most useful things to say. He was silent for a few minutes, and meanwhile Gypsy sat waiting patiently until Galopoff should choose to speak. At length the pony said, I think, Gypsy, that the wisest rule for you to follow is to make friends with the men who can help you along. We animals are very clever in our own way, and people think I am especially so. But compared to men, we know almost nothing. Now that is the truth. If you try to get along by yourself, you may get into the pound, or be caught by the dog catchers, or shot, or I don't know what. But you can make friends easily. A pleasant look, a wag of the tail, and people will see you are a pleasant sort of dog. Thank you, said Gypsy. And they will help you along, Galopoff ended. How did you expect to make a start? By going to the big city, Gypsy said. I meant to take a big ship to cross the ocean. And did you mean to get to the city on foot? Of course, said Gypsy. Now that is foolish, Galopoff said. A wise dog can go anywhere. You don't use your brains. What shall I do then? Gypsy asked. Here, said Galopoff, trotting toward a stump in the field. Jump on this stump, and then hop on to my back, and I'll take you over to the railroad, and on the way I'll tell you how to get a ride. Gypsy did as he was told and in a few moments he stood firmly on Galopoff's back. Then the pony trotted away toward the gate in the fence. Coming to the gate, Galopoff opened the latch with his mouth, trotted out into the road, and then, in a long, easy canter, away they went down the road to the station. Suddenly Galopoff halted. Wait, said he, I forgot something. Get down for a moment. Gypsy made a flying leap from the pony's back and alighted in the road. Then, to his great surprise, Galopoff reached round, caught hold of the end of the ribbon that bound the edge of his fancy blanket, and tore off quite a long strip. Now come here, said the pony. Gypsy, completely puzzled, came nearer, and then Galopoff put the bit of ribbon around the dog's neck, and even made a simple knot in it, after making many failures. There! said Galopoff, with great satisfaction. Now everybody will think you are the pet of some nice little girl. But what good will that do? asked the puzzled dog. I can't see any use in that. It will be of the greatest use, Galopoff answered. In the first place, people will know that you will not bite, and that's very important. Besides, people do not like stray dogs and the ribbon makes you look as if you had a home. I'm afraid it will come untied, 
said Gypsy. It will stay for a while, the pony answered, and the first woman or little girl you meet will be sure to tie it in a bow knot for you. They can't help it. It is one of their instincts. Gypsy didn't like the ribbon, but he thought it best to say no more on the subject, so he quietly hopped up to his place on Galopoff's back, the pony stooping down for the purpose, and when they were once more under way, Gypsy asked, "'How shall I get a ride on the train?' "'Very simply,' Galopoff answered. "'You know a baggage car when you see it?' Gypsy said he did. "'Then, as soon as the train stops, you must jump into the baggage car. "'It is a high jump, but you have been trained in leaping, and you can do it, I'm sure.' Gypsy said he thought he could. "'After you are in the car, you must sit up when the brass buttons man comes, and beg.' If you sit still and keep begging, and he happens to be good-natured, he will laugh and let you ride. Do you think he will? Gypsy asked. I know he will, said Galopoff. I don't see, said the little dog, how you know so much, Galopoff. Oh, I just keep my eyes and ears going, Galopoff answered, delighted to be praised. And when I learn things, I remember them. But here is the station, just over the hill. It won't do for people to see you on my back, or they'll think it queer. So down with you, say good-bye, wag your tail for good luck, and away you go. They heard the whistle of the train, and Gypsy scrambled down. He said good-bye in a hurry, and wagged his tail as he ran for the station. Galopoff stood near the roadside, and snorted a cheery farewell. The train came to a standstill with a queer hissing of the brakes and a great crunching of the brake shoes. Gypsy, with one last look at Galopoff, took a good running start down the road, around the station building, and jumped into the open door of the baggage car. There was no one in that part of the car when Gypsy entered, and he crouched in a corner ready to carry out Galopoff's advice as soon as he should see the brass buttons man. The car was what is called a combination car, that is, the rear part was fitted up to carry light freight, while the rest of it had regular seats for passengers. Gypsy kept quiet, and pretty soon the car started. For ten or fifteen minutes more, no one came in, and then suddenly the door opened and the conductor entered. He glanced sharply about, and soon saw the little dog in one corner. Hello! he exclaimed good-naturedly. Where's your ticket? Gypsy remembered Galopoff's directions and at once sat up on his haunches, as he had been taught. This made the conductor laugh, and he looked at the solemn little dog with a kindly smile. You seem to be a pleasant passenger, he said. I guess I won't ask for your ticket. You can make yourself comfortable. Wait, I'll give you something to lie on. The conductor went to a closet in the corner of the car, opened it, drew out an old piece of sacking, and spread it out, so as to make a comfortable bed. There, said he, now you're as snug as a bug in a rug. Gypsy wagged his tail gratefully, looked up at the conductor, and gave a deep little bark of contentment. The man was pleased, patted him on the head, and then left the car. Knowing that he had a long journey after leaving the train, Gypsy settled himself for a comfortable nap and in a few minutes was dozing and dreaming, more at his ease than the people in the parlour car ahead. He dreamed of being back in Paris with his old master, and of going through his tricks in the street to earn the pennies that brought daily bread for both. Gypsy must have been tired, for he slept soundly until the train came to a stop in the big New York City station, and he woke only when the men began to tumble freight about. Then he got up from his bed of sacking, stretched himself, sneezed once or twice, shook the dust out of his coat, and, going to the door of the car, looked out into the station. People were walking along toward the waiting rooms, and Gypsy, jumping down, followed them. Again he discovered that Galopoff was a very clever pony, for pretty soon he noticed that a little girl was patting his head. He stopped at once, and again sat up. "'Why, what a nice little dog!' exclaimed the girl, bending over him, and then, noticing his ribbon was loose, she took hold of the ends, untied them, smoothed them out, 
and immediately retied them in a very neat little double bow-knot. "'There,' she said, flattening it into a regular butterfly shape. "'Now run along, doggy, or you'll lose your master.' Gypsy again set his tail to wagging and his feet to trotting, and soon found himself in front of the big station, where there was a row of cabmen making all the noise they could. One of these stamped and clapped his hands as the dog passed, and Gypsy, shying to one side, set off at a run across the street. When at a safe distance, he slowed his pace, for he suddenly remembered that he didn't know exactly where to go. The next thing he had to find out was where to take the steamer for Europe. By this time it was late in the afternoon, and Gypsy began to be hungry, so he now had two problems before him. First, to find a supper, and next, to learn where to take the big boat to carry him over the sea. Of course, the supper question was to come first, and it seemed a puzzler. Many little dogs would have known no way of getting a meal, but Gypsy had not run about the streets of Paris without sharpening his wits. He did not yet know much about fun or joking. His life had been too hard for that. But he had much practical good sense, and could pick up a living where a lap-dog would have starved. So now he picked out the busiest street he could find, and went trotting slowly but steadily along, keeping a bright lookout for a butcher's shop. He had gone only a few blocks when he saw a stout red-faced man in a white apron, standing at an open doorway. Then Gypsy knew he might hope for a bone at least. He trotted bravely up to the man, and stood quietly, wagging his tail slowly. The butcher looked down at him, and then turned away. Gypsy waited. Soon the butcher came back with a bone that made the dog's mouth water. Catch, said the butcher, tossing it in the air. Gypsy jumped and caught the bone, and then slowly trotted to the curb to eat it. This pleased the butcher, and he said, You've good manners, I see. Gypsy ate the bone, and then trotted away, waving a few grateful wags to the kindly butcher as he went. Thus the first of his little problems was pleasantly over. The second seemed harder. Yet now that he was fed, Gypsy had more courage, and set his mind busily to work, trying to find where to look for the big ships. When he had come across the ocean with the Gypsy folk, he had landed in New York, and he remembered how the docks and piers looked. Where they were he did not know but he thought he could find out if he kept his eyes and ears open, as Galopoff had advised. He began to try to remember all he could about the vessel and the people on board. Gradually it became clear to him that there were two kinds of people on the ship, the travellers and the men who sailed the vessel. Then he remembered how the sailors looked, how they were dressed, and how queerly they walked. "'I'll keep a sharp lookout.' said Gypsy to himself, on all the people that pass, and maybe I'll see a sailor. If I do, I will just follow him till I find a ship. He was so delighted with this idea that he began to skip and to run faster, hardly noticing where he was going. In this way, he got into trouble. While he had been going quietly along, nobody noticed him, but when he hurried, he attracted attention. Soon a newsboy saw him, and at once gave chase. Gypsy was frightened. He knew that the boy would be sure to try and keep him for a pet or a plaything, and Gypsy had no time to spend in that way. As the boy came near, Gypsy began to growl, and at once took to his heels in earnest. It was a hard chase. The boy ran well, and Gypsy had to dodge to avoid being caught. Besides, other boys joined in, and before many minutes, there were three after him. Gypsy's heart began to beat fast, and his breath came short. He saw that the boys would not give up the chase unless they should be scared or outrun. Gypsy made up his mind to try scaring them. So he turned suddenly, and with a growl that sounded very savage, he bared his teeth and ran straight at one of the boys. At once the boy stopped and jumped aside to avoid the charge and cried out to the others, "'Look out, boys! He'll bite you!' The other boys stopped running, and then, before they could recover themselves, Gypsy dashed to one side, put on all the speed he could, turned down a side street, and away he went. 
he was not at ease until he had gone around two corners, and then, seeing he was not followed, he slowed down again. "'That teaches me something,' said he. "'If I go quietly, people won't notice me, but if I jump about, somebody is sure to get after me.'" End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy, the Talking Dog, a story for young folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 10 The Sailor and the Ship. All the rest of that evening Gypsy wandered about the city without bringing himself any nearer to finding out how to begin his voyage across the ocean. He met many city dogs, but while a few barked or growled at him, most of them he found too busy to pay any attention to him. He exchanged greetings with one or two, and growls with one or two more, and that was all. Presently dusk came, and Gypsy saw that he must be thinking of lodgings for the night. Now, this was something he knew little about. He had always gone to his master's home, and so had no experience in securing other quarters for the night. He tried to make friends with one stray dog, and to ask questions, but the dog laughed at him. You're no tramp dog, he told Gypsy, or you wouldn't be wearing a silk necktie. So the bow that had helped him was in this case worse than useless, and Gypsy was forced to rely on his own wits. Once he thought himself in luck, for, coming to a deserted alley, he saw it filled with old boxes and barrels, in one of which he felt he might sleep dry and warm for the night. Gypsy turned joyfully into the alley, and began to poke about to select the box that was most comfortable. While he was nosing here and there, suddenly he heard a fierce growling, and a big bulldog came at him, with a whole broadside of white teeth, saying in a terrifying tone, Get out of this, or I'll shake every tooth out of your jaw. Gypsy was no coward, but he saw no use in fighting, and so he turned and retreated. But he didn't hurry himself, he simply went somewhere else. His next venture was luckier. He came upon an old iron pipe, lying in a vacant lot. One end of the pipe was against the corner of the fence, and Gypsy backed into it and went to sleep, knowing he could defend himself against anything small enough to crawl into his lodging. He woke rather late next morning, and at once betook himself to the search for somebody that looked like the sailors he had seen on board the steamer. But first Gypsy was clever enough to find his way back to the butcher shop, where, though the butcher was busy, he was fed and treated kindly. Then Gypsy wandered out into the city streets again, gradually going further downtown, because since it was early morning, most of the men seemed to be going that way. It was nearly noon, and Gypsy had wandered down toward the Brooklyn ferries, when he saw a sailor. The man was dressed in dark blue trousers, a rough flannel shirt, and a queer round cap. But Gypsy would not have known he was a sailor, except for his rolling gait. The man walked as if the sidewalk was tipped to and fro under him. Aha, said the dog to himself, there's a sailor at last. Now I'll just keep him in sight until he goes to some ship. Then I'll know what to do. It was not difficult to keep near the man, for he walked slowly, continually looking about him. Gypsy decided that he must be a stranger in the city, and most likely a foreigner, for the sailor seemed to be interested by everything he saw. He gazed into shop windows, stopped at the corners, looked up at the tallest buildings, and spoke to no one. Of course Gypsy couldn't tell whether he had just come ashore, or how soon he would return to his ship but the dog could think of nothing better to do than to follow and take chances. There were other sailors met now and then, and there seemed no reason why Gypsy did not follow one of them, except that the first sailor he had seen somehow pleased him better than the others. At last, all question of leaving his first choice was put aside, for the sailor, happening to run into an old clerk who came hurrying out of a doorway, said, removing his hat, Pardonnez-moi, monsieur, so Gypsy knew that he had by chance chosen a French sailor, and he decided to follow this one to the end, if there seemed any hope of his going aboard a ship. And follow him he did until noon, when the sailor entered a restaurant in a street bordered on one side by houses, and on the other by docks and ships. 
Gypsy was delighted when he came to this street, and began to believe he should find a way of crossing the ocean to Europe, and he was so afraid of losing sight of his guide that he sat down near the door of the eating-house to wait until the sailor should come out. There was much loud talking and laughing inside, and Gypsy soon learned from what he overheard that some of the other men were making fun of the French sailor's broken English. At first the talk was good-natured, but as it went on it became ill-humoured, and at last ended in a quarrel. There was some scuffling, and then the French sailor came flying out, with one of the others running after him. Both were going at the top of their speed, but the Frenchman was the lighter-footed, and soon gained so far on the pursuer that the other gave up the chase, and returned to the eating-house. As the Frenchman had dashed out, he had dropped his hat. There was no time to turn back for it, and the man ran on bareheaded. Gypsy, seeing a chance to do the man a kindness, picked up the hat, and tore away after the French sailor. Gypsy did not have far to go, for the sailor soon stopped his wild flight, and fell into a walk. Gypsy trotted along behind, carrying his hat in his mouth. When the sailor at last noticed the little dog following, he was delighted to recover his hat, praised Gypsy, patted him, and talked French in a way that warmed the little dog's heart toward him, especially as the sailor was a handsome, black-eyed young fellow with a smiling mouth and kindly voice. The two made friends at once, and the sailor walked on, with Gypsy following close at his heel. "'You'd make a good sailor's dog,' the sailor said in French, and Gypsy barked and jumped about. "'Very well, then,' the sailor went on. "'Come aboard with me. We sail this afternoon, and if the old man doesn't say no, you shall sniff salt air.' Of course Gypsy was delighted, and followed more willingly than ever, feeling that he was born to good luck. The two turned in at a doorway on the water side of the street, and the sailor, picking Gypsy up in his arms, carried him into a queer room where there was a great crowd of people. It was a ferry, but Gypsy didn't know that, and the dog was very much surprised when they went on the ferry boat and put off from shore. Gypsy enjoyed the trip across the river, but thought it the shortest voyage he had ever known. Reaching the other side, the sailor set him down again, and then, after a not very long walk, they found themselves on a long wooden pier beside a real ocean-going vessel, but one much smaller than that on which Gypsy had crossed the ocean. The sailor again lifted Gypsy, and, climbing up a steep plank, took him aboard the steamer. "'What you got there, Jack?' asked another sailor, who was mending his jacket, sitting cross-legged on the deck. "'A little friend I made in New York. I got into a sort of scrap with some persons in a place, and when they called me frog-eater, I pulled the nose of one. Then I ran, and my cap it fell off, and this little fellow ran behind at my feet, and brought me my cap with much kindness. Then I asked, will you become a sailor's dog? And he did wag his tail, and so I adopted him. Cap'n won't have it, said the other sailor. That is to be known, said the French sailor. I can but ask. Come, he said to Gypsy, and took him forward into the forecastle. Gypsy was so pleased to be really on a steamer again that he found even the sailor's dark, crowded quarters very delightful. At all events, thought Gypsy, this is better than sleeping in a pipe on a vacant lot. The captain came aboard that afternoon, and Gypsy was soon wakened out of a nap to be taken up on deck and exhibited. The captain seemed gruff, but not ill-natured. He looked at Gypsy and snapped his fingers. Gypsy sat up and kept still. Then the captain took a lump of sugar out of his pocket and tossed it toward the dog. Gypsy had been well taught in tricks, and he caught the sugar very cleverly. The captain laughed and held out his hand. Gypsy gave him a paw. He looks smart, said the captain, and he obeys well. He can do no harm, and he may catch a rat or two, so you may keep him, Jack. Thank you, sir, said the sailor. But, the captain went on, take off that ribbon. You can make him a sailor collar out of some stuff, but I won't have ladies' lapdogs on my ship. Yes, sir, said Jack, untying the ribbon and throwing it over the side. Come below, he said to Gypsy, and I'll make you a collar more in shipshape style. And Gypsy went forward, thankful that he was to begin his voyage, and thinking that even Galopoff would hardly have managed better. End of chapter 10